marriage and counseling partnership model that we developed during our panel. So Gerd, I think uh, you know you might want to work more on that and turn that into a you know pipeline. Well, now now you disclose to the public what is my plan B. If venture capital doesn't work out, I'm going to set up a dating company. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, you inspired a couple of people to uh, trust you already on that level. So uh, let's see what happens. Okay, Hazel is closing the door. I can kick off, Hazel. Good. Thumbs up. Welcome to all of you uh, for this afternoon. And actually, we are still all right, as we would say in Malaysia, but I don't think there are many Malaysians here. We are okay la in terms of participation. I gave a talk over there about renewable opportunities in Malaysia and I was expecting more, but they actually have less over there in the power generation. So the green tech guys, we're still doing fine. And our first panel is gonna be an exciting one. Um, we are gonna have the corporate venture capital gurus here. Um, Dominic Emery, Chief Development Officer, BP Alternative Energy. Jan Westerhus, investment partner, Robert Bosch Venture Capital, GmbH, and then uh, Gerd Goethe, you know him from this morning, investment partner, Siemens Venture Capital. So I won't make any other uh, major statements at this stage. What I've asked our panelists is to give us an overview what they are looking for in terms of their venture capital agenda and outfit and what experiences they've had with clean tech investment that really worked for them and for the companies that they invested in. So, uh, gentlemen, who wants to take the lead? Gerd, over there on the right-hand side. You give me a microphone and I'll start talking. Um, you know how it works. <laughs> Be Good. careful what you ask for. Um, so, let me, let me talk maybe a minute or so about Siemens Venture Capital. The organization was put in place um, in January 99. Um, that was after we actually had made a few investments out of operating units and we recognized there's a little bit of a pattern behind it and maybe we want to have a dedicated team doing that rather than bloody amateurs out of the, out of the business unit. When I say bloody amateurs, I was one of those and I had no clue what I was doing but I did it anyways. Um, so the organization was put, put in place in early 99 with a dual mandate, um, we clearly have a strategic mandate. We always look for potential synergies with the operating business, and the reason behind that is to find innovation that is applicable um, and beneficial to the Siemens operating business. But then we are, at the end of the day, we are financially motivated. Um, so look at it as there's a strategic filter for us. Um, when we consider an investment opportunity, we always check is there synergies either immediate or potential uh, synergies with the operating business, but then we assess the, the investment opportunity based on its financial merit. Um, we've been around for 14 years now. Over those 14 years, we've invested in over 150 portfolio companies. Um, total capital allocated to that is um, over a billion dollars. Um, it's balance sheet money, so we don't have a fund set up structure. With one very recent exception to that one for China, we've actually set up a dedicated um, RIMIB fund now um, as a local investment vehicle in, in China. Geographical setup headquarters in Germany, being a good German company, that's what you do, set up headquarters in Germany. Um, then we have an office in uh, Boston, um, an office in Palo Alto, which is home for me now, um, and the office in, in Beijing. In total, we are about 35 people in the organization, so it's, it's quite a sizable team. Um, I spoke about the mandate that we have. Um, what's the sweet spot of investments? Um, obviously, anything that relates to Siemens, but also um, in terms of stage, um, we prefer companies that have early product revenue. Why do we do that? Um, two reasons. One reason is we feel technology risk has been greatly reduced. There's a product which is being deployed. You can reference the customer and see how it's doing. Um, but also a company at that stage um, is a good, um, has a good chance to actually establish a relationship with Siemens and maybe leverage Siemens sales and marketing channels. That's the objective there. Our investment model is we are always a minority shareholder. We don't want to take control. Um, we always want to syndicate, um, syndicate with financial investors and or strategic investors. Um, ownership stake typically 5 to 20 percent. Um, initial check size maybe 1.5 to 7.5 million dollars. 
Um, we take board seats in about two-thirds of our uh, new investments and um, for the remaining ones we have observation rights so it's important for us um, we want to be in the boardroom. Um, we do lead financing rounds um, or co-lead financing round if the opportunity presents itself. Um, that's maybe in 40% of our cases. Let me stop here and pass on to the others. All right, Dominic. Thank you. Well, my name is uh, uh, Dominic Emery. I am the Chief Development Officer for uh, BP Alternative Energy. Um, and within that, we have our corporate venturing activity that we, we now call BP Ventures. Uh, historically, we were called Alternative Energy Ventures, but actually in the last 18 months or so, what we've started to do is to make more general energy technology investments in support of BP's core oil and gas businesses. Um, so we're kind of moving from clean to cleaner or green to greener uh, as we're seeing the opportunity to support our core businesses by corporate venture capital investments uh, increase. Um, much of what Gerd has said actually applies to us in terms of we are um, essentially an on-balance sheet investor. The same kind of investment level of between kind of one and seven, uh, seven million dollars uh, into individual companies. We will tend to take a board seat, either as observer or, or, or director. Um, but in terms of the kind of the sweet spots where we're kind of focusing our investment activity on at the moment, um, they, they in, the, in the first instance do have to have kind of strong strategic coherence with, uh, with, with BP's activities. And for any investment that we make, we will always have a sponsoring uh, BP business, be it a downstream business in, uh, in chemicals, um, be it an upstream business in, in drilling uh, or in enhanced oil recovery, it's very, very important that we get, uh, we get business sponsorship. So that will apply generally to about maybe 75 to 80 percent of our, of our investments. Uh, but we also give ourselves the opportunity to make what we would call disruptive investments uh, that may not always be to the liking of our core businesses because they could potentially be competitive with them, but it's important that we understand the kind of the full landscape of energy innovation um, take, for example, electric vehicles, not something that an oil company like BP would be obviously interested in um, directly, but clearly if electric vehicles kind of come to pass at the kind of size and scale that they could do, that will very much disrupt our core business model, which is liquid transportation fuels. So understanding that in some depth is, is quite important, and making disruptive investments, however distasteful they may be to our core business, is something that's quite, uh, quite important for us to do and we're kind of not, uh, not ashamed to doing that, even though the, the, the justification may be more challenging. And just to put our ventures activity into context, we have, um, we're, we're quite a bit smaller than, uh, um, than Siemens. We got going really in, in 2006, 2007. Majority of our investments have been made in the last uh, three years or so. So we have about $160 million uh, of invested capital in 33 ventures, five funds, and the balance into uh, individual companies. Um, and as well as the strategic um, um, importance of the investments, um, so we have strategically coherent, disruptive investments, there's obviously the, the necessity to uh, achieve some sort of financial return. So we put in place some fairly sort of stringent return hurdles, usually in excess of about kind of 20%, um, because financial returns are good for the soul. Um, it's also great to have companies that exit to make a great return. And so strategic is number one, but financial follows on very quickly behind that. So that's essentially kind of the, uh, um, the, the, the routes that we take for our corporate venture investments in, in BP. All right, interesting stuff. Now Jan. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jan Westerhus, and I need to make a tiny correction. Unfortunately, I'm not based in China anymore. I had to move back to Germany, but uh, there's planes, and so I take every opportunity to be back over here in Asia. Um, <clears throat> maybe before I start to come to RBBC and what we do, uh, <laughs> let me explain you a little bit about the, our mother company, Bosch, uh, because Bosch is not as visible as uh, Siemens or BP. Um, Bosch is a 52 billion euro revenue company. It's a privately held company, uh, active worldwide, 300,000 associates. And uh, let's say the DNA of the company is in automotive, actually. And here it's everywhere under the hood. Stuff you don't see, but it's very important. Um, 
it's a parts and component company, essentially everywhere active where you need to sense and measure something, then you need to process the data in an ECU, and then you need to uh, actuate something. <clears throat> so automotive is about 60% of revenue is the biggest part of the company. Uh, then we have an industrial group uh, that is doing hydraulics, that is doing big gearboxes for wind turbines. Um, we have an energy and building uh, group that is doing uh, thermal activity, uh, not thermal activity, uh, heat pumps, for example, um, and uh, building security systems, uh, fire systems, um, and last but not least, a consumer uh, business unit that is doing power tools, and uh, last but not least, a joint venture with Siemens for dishwashers and, and other household appliances. So. The company spans over a, a vast uh, field of uh, different technologies, applications, all centered around electric electronics, if you want to find a, a common denominator. And here comes in the um, clean tech also, because uh, a lot of what Bosch is doing is around energy efficiency, efficient energy conversion in cars, in motors, uh, in you know, thermal heat pumps, and so on and so on. It spans through the business. We as uh, RBVC have been founded in 2007 uh, and are active since then in, in investing all around what's currently of interest uh, to Bosch or maybe in the future. We do not need a specific business unit buy-in for our investments. But uh, of course the ideal situation is that uh, something develops between the startup and the big Bosch company because this is a, a triple win situation actually for us as investors hopefully for the startup and for Bosch and uh, of course we need for every invest, uh, investment that we do we need to have some strategic reason to do it so we would not be able to, to invest in, a, a, in horse betting in Macau or whatever. Um, our sweet spot is right after the company developed a prototype before they go and uh, develop to production if they already have some customers if they already have re uh, a regular product that's uh, even better for us um, we typically invest something like three to five million dollars euros uh, into a company in, a, in the first goal um, then of course there are follow-up financings we take board seats, we go um, lead the round, don't lead the round, always co-invest, um, always take minority positions and try to develop the companies uh, towards an exit within the typical time frame which is more dictated by the financial investors than let's say us strategics, we you know, could uh, endure longer than most uh, financial investors but in the end uh, we also have our financial goals and it's not only a nice to have, it's uh, a must have for us and we strongly believe that the good companies that really have strategic value to our mothership Bosch uh, also are hopefully success, uh, financially successful and if they're not, what's the strategic value, right? Um, so much for uh, us to set the scene, maybe uh, two or three examples about what, we can, what kind of uh, clean tech investments we do within RBBC. We have one investment, for example, in a company called uh, Synopsense. They're doing monitoring systems for big data centers um, to save energy here. Uh, it's a US company. Um, another example could be a company called Green Tea, uh, Green Peak. It's a Dutch company. They do um, RF chips, which is basically Zigbee. Very, very power efficient. Um, so for a remote control, you can use it for 30 years, switching your TV channels a thousand times a day. Uh, on one single battery, that's a trick. Um, or for example, we have an investment in a solar uh, company which is printing the uh, silver uh, connectors on the solar uh, cells in a very, very efficient uh, way. Basically, I think we're looking for the triple win here that you so nicely uh, identified. The investment should deliver good returns synergy with the uh, uh, company itself and the company itself, the investee, has a flyer. So that, that's what we are looking for here. Um, 
straight away any questions, comments from the audience. Let's open it up immediately for interaction. My name is Lorraine. I am from Solvay Corporate Venturing. Um, the question is directed at Yen or Gerd. Um, I just like to tap your experience. Uh, I know you're no longer in China, but I'm keen to know about your uh, venturing experience in China simply because we are exploring, setting up uh, venturing activities there. So I'd like to hear more about your experience, your, you know, like exits, if you had easy exits and stuff like that. Anything that you can share. Thank you. Um, so a couple, couple observations. We, we set up our office um, in 2005, if I recall correctly. Um, and on day one, before we even started um, um, setting it up, we, we said it's only going to work if we have a local person, um, but a local person that we feel comfortable working with. Um, so we ended up hiring um, Madeline Song, who is a Chinese national, um, educated in North America, with a couple years of work experience in North America, went back. So that helped us um, establish the trust, which is, I think, key to do that, but also made communication much easier because she had that understanding, um, lived in both cultures, but lived in, and worked in, in both environments. Um, so that was, that was a good starting point. In terms of finding opportunities, um, we realized that the typical deal in China looks a little bit different than the typical deal, for example, in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, very deep on technology. It's always about um, technology applying um, to a new um, problem or um, an existing problem, um, but it's always driven by the technology and then we rely on in intellectual property and all those good things. In China, it was much more about <coughs> applying existing technologies, new business models, so the innovation is a different kind of innovation. Um, less technology, more um, about bringing something to, to the market, um, which also means the requirements for the team are different. Um, in terms of structuring an investment, um, there was um, in the old days where a lot of the VC investments were still done offshore, um, and we've we've done that, and it's it's complicated, but um, good lawyers could could work it out. No no big issue there. The market dynamics have changed substantially over the last few years, and um, what we felt um, being an offshore investor puts us at a strong disadvantage. So we've ended up making the decision about two years ago to set up a local vehicle. Um, which was, from a legal point of view, a serious, serious undertaking, setting up three local entities and whatsoever, so it's a whole hierarchy, and, and um, I don't know how many of the red stamps we have on different papers. <laughs> um, we ultimately got it done a couple of weeks ago. And so we, we now have, a, have an RMB fund, and we can invest locally, and I think that should help us greatly in uh, getting deals done. We just felt like we are moving too slow and, and needing all the approvals for an offshore investment, and it didn't work well for us. Um, you asked about exits, um, so over the years we've made a couple investments in China. Last year we had two exits. Um, one of them, interestingly enough, was to a private equity player who really wanted to, to um, acquire that business and offered a great price. Um, so a little bit of different exit channel than what we are used in, in, in the other geographies where it's mostly strategic M&A and sometimes IPO. Yeah. Uh, well, we're a little, we're not as, as advanced. Uh, actually, we're still cutting through the red tape of setting up uh, an office here. It's um, the, the reason why we have not done it yet is twofold. First of all, we had to establish our uh, current offices in Israel, Germany, and the United States. So China is next. That's number one. Uh, and we're doing this, uh, but frankly, we're a tech investor. And um, we don't see so much high tech coming out of China yet. I'm sure it will come, and this is why we're preparing for it, but we're taking it uh, step by step. But a key, key point for, uh, just to expand on that one, because um, um, Jan hit on a, on a critical one. Um, a, key, a key point for us in setting up the China operation was actually to get a better understanding, to get more involved into what are the requirements in emerging um, markets. Um, we come too much with the, the German mindset, which is the best technology is barely good enough and we need to make it better every year. Um, and not the mindset of what is good enough to do the job. 
and that I is one of the ways. things that's one of the things we wanted to learn from that and I think um, we've we've learned a, long, a, a number of lessons and there's I'm sure there's a ton more to learn just just to complete on China in uh, with BP ventures we have made a uh, we have local presence um, one of our venturing team is based out in Beijing um, and we chose to invest through a fund um, which we found actually gave us great access to both kind of technology and importantly to kind of new business models. So that was our preference to invest via our fund. In theory, our time has run up, but I've got a full panel here. Some of the other panels coming up. I've got one or two people missing, so I'll overstretch it a little bit. Uh, I would like to ask you like a concluding question. Um, you are all big boys. You've all been in the solar industry. You've all been in green tech. One, has been your green tech investments underperforming or overperforming compared to average investment yields? And why have you guys all dropped out of solar, as far as I understand, and what's the future of that industry? So that's a, maybe a bit much for a final question, but try and keep it short and sharp too. Um, so the, the short answer is the jury is still out in terms of investment performance. Why is it still out? We've seen a couple exits, and some of them were, were good, and some of them were not so good. Um, holding periods tend to be longer. Um, in clean tech investments, those businesses have a longer sales cycle, and quite often also you move from uh, developing a technology to building capacity to building projects, um, which is not really where the venture model is at its sweet spot. Um, so we need to see that, and we are driven by IRRs, and that's a concern. The longer holding period is not the friend of your IRR. So that's, that's a question mark. Um, in terms of solar, um, I think it's a pretty rough market environment right now when you're playing on the cell and module level. Um, but honestly, I think it's a healthy thing for the industry because it indicates it's a maturing industry, and it's driven by economics and cost positions, and no longer just by technological hype. Um, so that, that was not good for Siemens, and we've, we've dropped out of, that, um, out of that part of it. Um, we are still involved in a couple downstream activities, and um, those of you who listened yesterday to Peter Shannon, we have an investment in Cubotics, for example, which is um, a balance of system play, and we are very excited about the prospects for that company. All right, thank you. Dominic? Um, so at risk of repeating what Gerd just said, it is kind of too early to tell. I would say on balance so far with our clean tech investments, um, we've had a couple of, cut a couple of good exits. Um, we've also had a couple of write-offs. Um, holding periods are, are longer. Um, the kind of sweeter spots that we're seeing at the moment tend to be in the world of um, high value, um, either chemical or kind of fuel products and biomass. So rather than trying to kind of pile it high, sell it cheap, look for kind of high value products. Um, so biolubricants and biochemicals seem to be more interesting areas uh, for us at the moment. Um, and then coming back to the solar question, um, why did we get out? Couldn't make money. Um, been, we, BP was in the solar business for 35 years, um, and so it was a real emotional wrench to come out. But as soon as the business got commoditized in the way that it did, and we were in the manufacturing, um, we were in the full, the, kind of the full chain, uh, we may have just stayed in the kind of the project development business, but uh, we couldn't really see our way clear to making returns in that. So we got out of manufacturing the first instance and then project development. And now all we have are two solar venturing investments that we continue to hold uh, for the future. Yeah. Okay, um, as for us, um, split answer, Bosch uh, got into solar very late um, and is getting out currently. Um, I think the reason is, is fairly simple. Um, as you said, you know, Bosch was playing the high-tech card, wanted to uh, invest into a really you know, good uh, high-tech German um, technology and ignored the market dynamics. Uh, you can quote me on that, please, but I think that's, that's what it is. Um, as for us uh, at RBBC, um, regarding clean tech, I think it's a, it's a mixed balance. I mean, the, the uh, overall accounting still has to be done. But uh, we've been burned by one investment in the solar space. I mean, who doesn't right now? Um, but there's other investments like, for example, this uh, energy saving company for service centers that's uh, running quite well. And um, so I, I think clean tech is still on the map. And I personally am happy that the bubble thing is kind of gone now. Now we can start to do <laughs> business in the space and not uh, invest on hope.
And maybe after the bubble has burst, it's the best time to get in in some areas where valuations are cheap and the upside uh, might be uh, just around the corner. So uh, maybe that's a good uh, place to finish up. We're looking for a triple win. And thanks a lot for our corporate venture guys for an entertaining and uh, very insightful session. Thank you.